What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the Hangout Spot, where you already know it's Real Talk Sports Talk, live from my man cave, it's your boy, Johnny, and let's talk some sports, but today we're going to do it with a little bit of a twist. We're actually going to do it with a little bit of comedy twist, because I have a very, very special guest, um, and this guy is, is, is absolutely my favorite comedian of all time, I mean, bar none. It's not because he's Hispanic, it's because he is a legend at his craft. He's been doing comedy for over 40 years. Um, he's been in the business uh, for that long. He's been in numerous uh, TV roles. He's been in movies. Um, you know, he's written, you know, uh, for the likes of George Lopez, Chris Rock. And you would probably also know him if you've been to a Mark Anthony concert. He's actually the opening act for Mark Anthony and has been on tour with him for over 20 years. And we'll elaborate a little bit on that. He is born and raised in New York City, and even though he's a Met fan, I won't hold it against him. But without further ado, I want to bring in my comedy idol, Mr. Joey Vega. What's going on, my man? Welcome to the Hangout Spot. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Man. Wow. It, it is an absolute honor to have you here, man. I, uh, you know, I, I wasn't lying, man. I mean, you are my absolute favorite. Um, I think the first time I, I, I saw you was at a Mark Anthony concert. It was it was in the early 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. And, and that's how I know that you guys go way back. Yeah, yeah. And that opening act was hilarious. And we got to, you know, after that, I was like, man, I got to I got to I got to catch this guy at one of his shows, man. You know, I got to catch him at one of his shows. So I've been to a couple of your shows. Right. I've been to a couple of shows. Um, I think the first one I went to was at Hunter College. Uh, that you did way back, it was uh, it was hilarious. I mean, of course, it was sex. <laughs> of course, of course. And then I've been to another. Uh, I, I've been to a, probably about two other of your shows. The last one was in Allentown uh, when I lived in Pennsylvania, and uh, you were gracious enough after that to uh, to talk and shake hands and, and take a picture with with well, me. And I'm after the shows, I like to talk, and see the people that came out, and be very I'm very appreciative. So I like to talk to them. You know, shake hands, sign an autograph, sign a breast if is if, if there's a breast available, take pictures, <laughs> <laughs> whatever I can to make them happy. Whatever you can, right? Oh man, I don't know. I just want to kind of open it up here because you know we'll we'll talk a little bit of sports later on, but I want to talk about your career, you know, a little bit for my viewers because um, you've been in you've been in show business for quite a long time. I've been doing it for a long time. You know, I actually. Uh, I actually compare my career to sports. My career is like I'm a baseball player, right? I'm in the minor leagues, and I do my shows. That's basically the minor leagues, right? Do my shows here and there at comedy clubs. And then every so often, I'll get called to the major leagues to perform with Chris Rock or Mark Anthony. You know, that's the major leagues because I'm doing arenas. You know, whenever I perform with Chris it's rock. It's an, it's either a, a, an arena or a, a you know casino. Whenever I perform Mark Anthony, that's an arena. It's always an arena, you know. Right. Well, that's and then I get I get sent down to the minors. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't I, I I wouldn't necessarily say the minors, man. I mean, because every I mean every show I've been to, you you know, you sell out. I mean, people come out to see you. And the reason why I love your comedy so much is because, you know, being a Hispanic, you know, growing up in New York City, I can relate to it. You know, it's very, very relatable. And um, I said, I make it relatable no matter who the audience is. Like if the audience is a white audience, I make it relatable to them. You know, a lot of the times it's almost the same material. Some of it is the same material. I just make it relatable. But then when it's a Latino audience, I have to put in the, you know, Spanish words here air, give it a, a Latin flair to it. So no matter who is in the audience, they're going to have a good time because I'm going to make it relatable to everybody. So. Right. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely see that. I've also seen a lot of your stand-up stuff on, on, you know, on TV as well, but it's got to be a big difference doing comedy today than doing comedy, you know, 10, 20 years ago. I mean, especially with the world that we live in today. Like, you know, how hard is it 
you know, because now it seems like anything that anybody says, you know, people get offended by, right? And yeah. as comedians, that's what you guys do. You guys live on that, right? If we push the envelope, you know, and 20 years ago, very easy. I used to go on and mark shows and I used to do everything, that, anything and everything. And now recently I was, I did a mark show. I forget where it was, but uh, after the show, this girl came up to me and started yelling at me because I said gordita. I said that I say that I like I in my act I say I like I like golditas. Where are the golditas? Right? Raise your hand. I can see you from here. I love golditas. I love them with the little chicho. And I don't say anything bad. I just say that I like golditas, right? right. And, and this girl started yelling at me. You're shaming. You're this. You're that. She wasn't even goldita. She was just taking somebody else's cause to heart, you know, and uh, you know what, I then what I came back with was, you know what, I'm just trying to make you laugh. Now, you tell me, do you dance to all the reggaeton music that they're talking about women and they're talking, they're belittling women and they're putting women down and they're using women as sex objects? You dance to that, right? But meanwhile, I say, Goldita, you get offended. I don't, I don't see the logic, you know, That's a good point. how to zip it. That is a great point. Um, does it does it change the way you come up with material? It doesn't because come up with material, but it does change. I do think about it. Who's that going to offend? Who's going to offend by that? But now, in the last few months, since I turned 70, right? In the last few months, I've been saying, you know what? The hell with it. I don't care. You want to cancel me? Cancel me. What, can you, what are you going to do? You're going to cancel me? I've been doing this 43 years. Yeah, it's time for me to be canceled. Are you kidding me? It's time. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah, because, you know, I thought about that. Like I said, I mean, I watch, you know, old school comedies and the stuff that they say back then. I mean, God forbid they were to say something like that today. Yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. I mean, some of the stuff that they said back then wasn't right. In today's climate, it isn't right. You know, certain words that they use, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not against free speech because that's what I do. But, you know, sometimes the world does evolve. Yeah. But other other than that, I, I, I really don't sense myself too much anymore. I did for a while, you know, when the whole, you know, politically correct bullshit came around. I did yeah. sense, but in the last few months, I'm just saying, I'm going to say whatever I, the only thing, the only problem that we run into now is being political, which I'm not political. I'm not a political comic. I have my political view, but I'm not a political comic. But if the audience thinks you sway one way, they hate you or they like you. And that's not, my job is to make you laugh. My job is to entertain you, whether you're a liberal or a conservative, whether you're an independent, I don't care. I just want to make you laugh. You know, that's my job. And it's not for you to know if I'm a liberal or a conservative or independent or if I don't care about politics. That's not for you to know. It's for me. If I'm fine. But my job is to make you laugh no matter what you are. Um, that's that makes sense. Really, you know. And that's censoring myself because I, I, really don't, I really don't want to get involved in all that, you know. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. What, um... What inspired you to become a comedian? Like, were you like, when you were growing up, were you like the class clown or something like that? Or the funniest kid in school? Person in the, in the class. You I was were the shyest person in the class? Person in my family. Wow. And you know what? Most comedians, most comedians, you name, a, you name a comedian, I'll tell you, he's very shy. Chris Rock. Uh, uh, oh yeah, Chris Rock very shy. Uh, what's his name? Robin Williams very shy. Even Dave Chappelle shy. No way. He's very shy. Yeah. Wow, I would have never thought that. <laughs> that you're on stage so much that you kind of start to take on the persona of the stage character, which is not really you. You know, like if we go to a place, if we're hanging out, I'm not the funniest guy. You know, there might be other people that are much funnier than me. I'll be funny, but I'm not the funniest guy, you know, usually. Because that's just the persona that you get that you that you have on stage. 
Oh, interesting. I would have never thought that. Adam Sandler, very shy, extremely shy. No way. <laughs> and you've uh, so you've written, you've written for for Chris Rock and yeah, and I believe that you've also written for uh, for George Lopez. Who, there were, there was a show or something like that. Staff writer on his uh, late night show. He had he had a late night show for a while on TBS, and I worked for about a year. Staff writer. Uh, I don't mind writing, but they really do. To become a writer, it's it's a bad life only because you work 12, 14 hours a day and you're constantly sitting there in front of the computer. Uh, you know, it, it's no life. I enjoyed the, the time that I did it. But I don't, I wouldn't want to be a writer. Like I have, I have friends that have made their whole living. They, they've been writers for 30 years and they've written on sitcom, they've written on animated shows, they've written movies and they're all very heavy first of all because all you do is sitting all day you know and you and then at the end they I know the feeling I know the feeling and then then what happens is that if you're working for a show they come in with a load of donuts and pizza just to keep your your, your energy up <laughs> and give up I mean I I have a hard time you know just I have to diet and exercise just to stay chubby <laughs> Makes sense. Speaking of writing, though, I always wondered, like, like how how do you guys develop content? Like, I know because a lot of stuff again you talk about happens in everyday life, but like when you come across something that you feel, oh, this might be good to to talk about. Do you do you have like a notepad? Do you write it down so you don't forget it? I mean, how do you guys develop content? The illegal yellow pad with with and a pen, but now you know you get on your phone and you record it. You go to notes. And you just talk into it. Notes always they they, they don't get every word. Mm -hmm. As you you say children put you know child something or you know they put another word in there, but or you or you record yourself and you say uh, this is a bit about my wife uh, uh, hitting me in my sleep. And she has restless leg syndrome. You know some some you know some something like that. So right. you to put in the notes. You either you know text it on the notes or you. Record it on the recorder, but it can happen at any time. Huh? But it can happen at any time, right? It can happen while you're in the in the, in the mall. It can happen while you're in the movie. It can happen at home, middle of the night. You wake. <laughs> sometimes you wake up thinking, "Oh, that's funny," and you write something down, or else you say, "I'm going to remember it," and you never remember it. Yeah, I could imagine. Never remember it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there? So then when you started to to get into comedy, is there any one comedian that really inspired you? Um, no, not really. Not really. I, you know, I loved comedy because my father used to watch comedy all the time. He used to watch comedy. He used to watch Cantinflas and he used to watch, you know, the Spanish shows, but he also used to watch the American shows. So I used to see a lot of the American comedians. I used to see them all the time. TV, you know, watching your father laugh, then you, of course, you want to make your father laugh, you know, and then that kind of got filled it without me realizing it, without me knowing that that's what I'm doing. Um, so, it's I, I have to say, my father inspired me. Wow. Okay. The love of comedy gave me that love of comedy. Comedy is just like music; uh, it's different today. To me, it was better back in the days. Of course, yeah. Yeah, it's just, I, I, I can't, I mean, I, I still love comedy, you know, but it just doesn't have the same feel. It's, it's different. It's like music. I can't, I can't mess with the music from today. I'm listening to 80s and 90s music because that's what I grew up on. That to me was the best. Freestyle, uh, old school hip hop. That's what I grew up on in the streets of Brooklyn and when I lived in the Bronx. But um, yeah, yeah. It, what, one thing I can say about you that I admire is that regardless of the times, like I said, I've seen you 20 years ago. I've seen you recently. You haven't changed much, man. It's still the same top-notch material, man. So I got to give it to you. Thank you. Yeah. No, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Is there any is there any comedian today that you would say you like or you admire, like one of your favorites today? That would be uh, Bill Burr is a fine. Um, if you watch Bill Burr, he takes chances. He doesn't care. Uh, he does care, but the thing is that he'll tell you, I'm against abortion. 
and everybody applauds. He goes, wait a minute, you know me, I'm gonna come up with something. You know, then he he flips it around and then he flips it back around. And his his way of thinking as a comedian is a genius way of thinking. It's it's just amazing the way he goes back and forth with he can take any topic. That's why there's no topic that's really you know uh, uh, that you can't touch. You can even talk about cancer, depending on who has the cancer, what type of cancer it is, and how you approach. And that's one of the most serious subjects is death and cancer. You know, and you think that oh well, don't talk about that. You know, even religion. Like I talk about religion, and it's not I don't put it down. So people listen to it and they go, oh, that's funny. Oh, he's looking at the at the absurdity of certain things. So. Bill Burr, Bill Burr is one of my favorite. Uh, of course, uh, Dave Chappelle, favorite. Uh, Chris Rock. I just like the way they think. You know, like a, com a lot of comedians could come up with jokes, eh, but then the way Dave Chappelle thinks and the way Chris Rock thinks and 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 Bill Burr, those are thinkers. You know, and they really, really, when they come up with a bit. It's thought out so well, you know. So to the guy that I, I wish I could be as, as good. I mean, I, you know, I look at them. Every comedian looks at another comedian that's killing, and they go, "Oh, I wish I was that good." But the fact is that it's art. So my, your interpretation is funny. Mine is funny too. And it's up to the audience to figure out who they like best, or who they enjoy today, and who they enjoy tomorrow. Like people say. Who's the funniest comedian? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. That's that's well. Yeah. That's I can tell you who my favorites are, but I can't tell you who the funniest is because it's like it's art. You know, you could a picture by Dali is beautiful, and then you see a picture by you know Picasso, that's beautiful too. So which one's better? I don't know. They're both beautiful. That's how you see. That's why I hate comedy competition. And you see that on TV. Right. And, uh, those last man standing or anything like that, last comic standing, because that's competition and you can't compete. Today I'm funnier than Dave Chappelle, and tomorrow he's funnier than I am. You know, so. What's your Mount Rushmore? If you had to pick your four Mount Rushmore of comedians, all uh, time. It could be, I know, I put you on the spot here, right? I told you this interview was going to be tough. George Carlin. George. George up there. I would have put Bill Cosby up there if he was talent only. He's got to be up there. Richard Pryor, Richard you know, Pryor. Chris Rock, got to be up there. Uh, Dave Chappelle, Eddie Murphy. For his time, he was. Gotcha. Just like Richard Pryor, some some stuff you look at Richard Pryor and you go, "Man, eh, it's not that funny," but he was the first one doing it. He was the one that came up with that stuff. So it was it was genius back then. You know, right now, so many people have done it. So much time has elapsed that so many other comedians have done things that are similar that you go, well, hey, you know, Richard Pryor. But he was the first one doing that at that moment. So that's the genius of it. And and I think Bill Cosby was one of the because I remember him not wanting to do material over and over. He would go on to the next bit, next bit. You know, you would see one show, then you see another show and two different shows. You know, and they go, well, why don't you do that thing that's so funny? He goes, because I already did it. Now I'm doing something new. You know, unfortunately, he got into the mess that he got into, but talent-wise, you got to keep him up there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good, that's a really good list, man. You, um, you've you been you've been touring with Mark Anthony for how many years now? 23. Wow. How did that happen? That was that was that's a long story, but I'll I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to abbreviate it. So I had a show back in 1988, I think it was. I had a show called Latin Connection, the 89, 88, 89. Well, the Latin Connection was about Latin artists, you know, freestyle. I had all the freestyle people on there, uh, but we ran out of people to interview, and. Mark wasn't singing yet, but he was. He helped to write a song for Sapphire. Baby, I've been told. Sapphire, okay. 
Yes, I remember. Helped write a song for her. So she was on the show and he came along and he said, you know what? Let's interview him because we're running out of people. There was no real Mark Anthony back then. There was no Jennifer Lopez. There was no Ricky Martin. There was no Enrique Iglesias. There was no Pitbull. So we ran out of people to interview. We said, well, let's, let's, let's interview that guy. So him and I hit it off. He loves So he, he would come to see me perform at the comic strip in New York. He would come all the time, all the time. He, he gave me a beeper number. Here's my beeper number, you know. And uh, just be when you're going to be at the and he would come down and see me all, every single time he would say the same thing. He would say, you know what? I'm going to be a singer. When I become a singer, can I open your shows? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I, he would always tell me that. And one day I was like, yeah, yeah. You know what? When you become a famous singer, I'll open the shows. All right? And he goes, bet. That's how it happened. When he started, wow. became big enough on the road, I was on his first tour. It was the first tour was all theaters all across the country in Canada. And he called me up. He said, you wanted, as a matter of fact, I opened the show Madison Square Garden when he did the uh, the, the HBO special. He did that, it. Was, that was back in early, what, 2000? 1999. 1999. He did an HBO special and he asked me to open the show at Madison Square Garden. That was like the biggest audience I had ever performed in front of. But it wasn't, my, my portion wasn't filmed. I was just the opening act for the show. So, and then his portion was filmed. So then after that, we went on the road. So this year, I only did two shows with him this year because I think it's starting to, you know, starting to calm down now. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know what the future is going to hold between, you know, me touring with Mark. You know, I've been doing it so many years. Um, and I know they got new management. They, you know, whatever. You know, if he calls me, you know, and I saw him and we had a great time together. We always joke around. You know, we always, uh, you know, we've been friends for, you know, 30 something years. Wow. Yeah. How How is Mark Anthony, not the singer Mark Anthony? He's a funny guy. Is he? Very funny guy. He would, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll make fun of you in, in a joking way, but he's very funny. He's very cordial. He's very, uh, uh, hospitable. He's a great host. Anytime I've taken anybody backstage to, to the dressing room, he's been nothing but the greatest. He's always been very, very attentive. Like, oh, yeah. Hey, how you doing? Yo, you're always, you know, and a very nice guy. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> maybe one time, huh? It's a lot of fun to be around with. I could imagine. Who knows? Maybe one day if I ever get big time doing this, maybe I'll have him on here. So anyhow, um, let's transition a little bit since this is a, a sports talk uh, podcast that I'm trying to put together. But again, I get engulfed in, in, in your comedic world. So I appreciate uh, the insight. Um, I think it's really interesting. But um, so you're a sports fan. And I think that uh, from conversations that we had, you are a baseball fan. I'm a baseball fan. I used to follow the Jets. Years ago, I used to follow the Knicks. Years ago, I haven't been following them lately. Um, but I am the Jets. I can tell you with the Jets, you haven't missed much. I, I know. I'm, I'm a diehard Jets fan, and, and yeah, screwed up his ankle the first play. First play. It's but, um, I uh, yeah, I've been a Mets fan since. This is how old I am. I've been a Mets fan since they first started. Since really? 19. I was nine years old, and I was, and my parents were Met fans, because, um, yeah, my my parents were Met fans, my my mother and my father, and so I used to watch the Mets with them, and uh, so I I've been I've been a Met fan the whole time, this whole, whatever it's what is it sixty years, sixty one years. So. so I'm surprised you didn't tell me that that's what inspired you to be a comedian. <laughs> hey, listen! I learned from the mess. The mess. Watching the mess does not make you laugh at all. <laughs> make you cry. Listen, like I tell everybody, I think I think every team that ends with the ETS, yeah, <laughs> Jets, Mets, Nets, and I happen to be I happen to cheer for the Nets because I was born and raised in Brooklyn. 
All right. When they, yeah, so when they moved over to Brooklyn, I was all pumped up about it, and you know, and all gun ho and all that stuff. And here we are, you know, just the same misery that I have as a Jet fan. So I do it to myself. I am a Yankee fan, so at least I get a little bit of joy. Well, they, yeah. But I got to be honest with you, man. Baseball has kind of soured on me over the years, man, because it's just again getting into music, getting into comedy. It's changed. Can I tell you one of the? I first of all, I'm very good. Every time I'm watching the Mets. You know, sometimes I watch it with my daughter because she's she's a Met fan, and whatever I say, Keith Hernandez says right after me, because I've studied baseball since I was a little kid, and all these change. You know what drives me nuts? I'm gonna tell you what drives me. This is ridiculous, right? They got a baseball cap, right? And mm -hmm. then they got the sunglasses on top of the cap, and they're upside down, and they're on the field, and the sun is shining. How I remember when I was a kid, you had to flip glasses, flip, just flip it. I used to used to see the you know the outfielders run, flip, flip it, and run. Mm -hmm. Now these baseball players, it's a style. It's just about style. It's not about the sport. It's about style. They got they got the up here and the managers. They don't say anything. Like if I was the manager of the Mets, I'd be take that shit off. Be right. just take that shit off your head. And if and if you go on the field. And you lose the ball in the sun, and you got your glasses up here. You're gonna sit. You're gonna sit the next week, and I'm gonna find you, cause it just it drives me nuts, man. And then I saw the other day, I saw uh, uh, one of my favorite players, uh, the shortstop for the Mets, um, uh, Lindor, Francisco this, Lindor. Yeah. So I saw Francisco Lindor, right? And he had his sunglasses in the back. He had them on the back. It's like. You're on the field. I can see if you're in the dugout. All right, whatever. But you're on the field in the back. What are you going to do if you look up and the ball's in the sun? I agree. I agree. And to your point with the style. It's little things like that. You know, yeah. the, the thing that they took the fall, you know, the intentional walk? They just do this now like you're fucking Little League or some shit. Now, how many times, I know because I've been watching, you know, since 1962, I've been watching baseball. How many times did they do an intentional walk and the ball got away from the catcher? Uh, a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Or the batter was close enough, as long as he doesn't get out of the batter's box, to hit the ball. Yeah, absolutely. So you took all that away. You took that away because you want to make the game faster, which is bullshit. But you got the replays now, and that takes five, ten minutes sometimes. It, it and, and and Joey, to, that's what I was alluding to. The game is just different. Yes, yeah, the way it's played, you know, the way it's managed now is analytically driven. Like yeah. managers are not allowed to make calls, you know, that they feel in their gut. Like, you know what? I'm going to leave this guy. In there. I'm going to take this out. The guy out my gut. Now it's you know, well, 75 pitches. That's it. You know, regardless of if he's rolling or not, you know, you're taking him out of the game. Um, you know, back in the days. You had guys like Ricky Henderson. They're stealing 130 bases. Now you'd be lucky if you get a guy that steals 30 bases. Nobody wants to steal bases anymore. They steal. They steal 25 bases. It's like, oh, he stole 25 bases last year. What? It's let, me see, let me give you a little statistic. One of my favorite pitchers now, not back then, is Juan Marichal. All right, Juan Marichal, Dominican dandy, they called him. Yeah. This guy, I think he won 200. My stats are going to be off. Uh, I'm just I'm just giving you a general generalization. Mm -hmm. I think he won 238 games, something like that. He completed over 200 games. So yeah. even games that he lost, he completed. Games that he won, he completed. There was one game against the uh, Milwaukee Brewers, I think it was. It was Milwaukee back then. Uh he was pitching against a guy named Warren Spahn. Mm -hmm. This guy was an older dude. He was a great pitcher. And they were in the 20th inning, and they were both pitching. I think it was the 18th inning. The 18th inning. And the manager told Juan Marichal, I'm going to take you out. You've pitched two games. He goes, you can't take me out. I'm 22 years old. That guy's 40, and he's still pitching. And, and he awesome. pitched 20, 22 innings, I think, like that. Now, now with all this exercise, with all this, you know, analytics and all special machines for the arm, oh, 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 
all these rubber bands to stretch out the ligaments. Now they could pitch seven innings. At, oh, we pitched seven innings. Ooh. If you're lucky, if you're lucky. Yes, I know. Seven innings if you're lucky. Because once you get to 95 pitches, out. Wow. It's, you know? I, 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 that drives me crazy when I watch a game. It drives me nuts. Another thing that drives me, I'm, I'm going to go all in on this. On yeah, the, let's do me. it. Now, I like I say, I'm an old dude, right? I watch... I used to watch baseball. It used to be from behind the umpire. The view was always behind the umpire, right? With the cameras were always set behind the umpire, you know? And you would always see the pitches coming in, the way the ball was hit. Now, every single pitch from home plate, uh, from center field. Center field, yeah. Always behind the pitcher, behind the pitcher. I'm tired of it. At least, at least you know, mix it up. You know, mix it up a little bit. That's the one thing about football is that they still they have the overhand camera the, the, that hangs that that's on the, on the wire, and they have different views. And you could you actually look sometimes you feel like you're on the on the field. You know, you're that close. With baseball, it's like you're always a spectator from behind the pitcher. You know. Yeah. Well, they, little things just drive me crazy. The fact that that they don't bunt anymore. They don't play small ball. They don't play small ball. The Mets, like three years ago, started playing small ball and started winning. And then they abandoned it. They, everybody wants to hit a home run. Yep. Yeah. You know how the triple is? You know how exciting a triple and how hard it is to get it? And how exciting a double is when there's runners on base? Or sure. a run, wheeze play? They took all that shit out. Yep. Yeah, and that's that's why it soured on me because when I was growing up, baseball was my first love. Yeah, I've been playing baseball since I was you know eight nine years old. You know, through high school, and again, you know, you had to take pitches, work the count, bunt guys over, steal bases, play defense. Now, I mean, guys like like you said, I mean, you don't have pure hitters like you did in the '80s. Guys that hit the ball opposite field in the gaps. Now everybody wants to pull the ball, you know, 500 feet. And, and it's okay. Like, I remember when I was growing up, if you struck out more than 200 times, that was frowned upon. Now, if you strike out 250 times, but you hit 30 home runs, you're good. Good, yeah, yeah. They don't even count the batting averages anymore. You know, like right now, they don't show you the stats for the batting average. They show you, the, you know, the the, the, the other uh, on-base percentage. They, but they don't show you batting average anymore, which sometimes it's, you know, you could have a 300 batting average, and it could be – you know that that you just hit whenever there's nobody on base. I understand that, but I like to see that batting average. You know, when you remember, you used to buy a baseball card, mm -hmm. and say, you know, all the all the years that he played and all the days and have at bats, they would have runs, they would have hits, then they would have home runs and oh, bats. You know, and and I think they had on base percentage too. Which I knew as a kid what the hell it was, but you know, but I didn't care because I used to look home runs, hits, batting average, you know, and how many games he played and what teams he played for, you know. But it's all changed, and I understand things evolve, but the way they changed it, they changed it not as an evolution, they changed it just to make it faster, just to make it this, just to make it that. The pitcher could only throw three times, you know, to to first base now, so that means after the second time. He's not going to throw because he has to get you out. Right. So that means you're going to take a bigger lead and you're probably going to steal on him. Now, I'm all for stealing. I want to see the steal. I want to see the catcher throwing the guy out. Or I want to see the, the, the you know, base runner stealing the base. I'm all for that. But, you know, you're taking strategy. Baseball was like a perfect game. Everything was perfect on baseball. Everything. Mm -hmm. Take it and they tweaked it, you know, the way, you know, not, not so perfect. No, it was beautiful. It, yeah. it was, you know, you, it's a beautiful. Yeah. Game. And people don't understand that because, oh, it's slow. No, no. There's a lot of strategy, man. There's a lot of strategy. This guy is a fastball hitter, and I'm a fastball pitcher. Should I throw him a fastball? Am I going to challenge him? Or am I just going to throw, you know, a slider? You know, make it look like a fastball, but it, but slider. You know, there's that strategy. Each pitch, there's a strategy in each pitch, you know. Yeah. Taking all that away, they taking you know. Well, most people don't understand the strategy anyway, unless you really know baseball. So. Yeah, no, I agree, uh, and we 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 are right here with that. We just we just crapped on baseball for about ten minutes. 
Yeah, and I love it. And I love it. <laughs> but we still love it. <laughs> can't take these players. The Mets. The Mets have a walking. They have a traveling hospital every year. Everybody gets hurt. Everybody gets hurt. I mean, I remember watching it, and when I was a kid, I used to love Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra. Those are my favorite. And there was another guy, Hector Lopez, which is, nobody knows. He's, he's like, nobody remembers Hector Lopez because he was just like a utility player. But he was mm -hmm. one of the only Latinos playing for the Yankees back then when I was a kid. So I like Yogi Berra, Mickey Mantle. These guys played 160 games at least every year. They never got hurt. I know. It's they crazy. Nowadays, you got these guys like all buffed out and everything. That's why they're getting hurt. They're, they're too buffed out. You know, the ligaments are too, they're already, you know, Mickey Mantle, he, didn't, he wasn't a muscular guy. He was a strong guy, but he wasn't, he didn't lift weights. You know, Yogi Berra, he looked like he should be selling ice cream somewhere. You know, but he was, he was amazing. He was amazing, Yogi Berra. So they, these guys yeah. getting the way the baseball, it just it annoys. Sunglasses on the cap. Ah, oh, that, that was that a good one. Guys, <laughs> that's, oh, God. Um, well, anyway. All the medallions and everything. You know, when I was a kid, they used to have to either put it in or take it off. They used to have to take it off. Now they got medallions. They got big pictures. You know, I'll sharp science. Yeah. <laughs> There's a yeah, a player on the Yankees, Verdugo, who who I guess he's used to wearing three or four chains. And the Yankee, I, I saw something on on online where the Yankees said he can only wear one chain. And they interviewed him, and he well, I don't know if he complained about it, but he you know he was like, well, you know, this is I got to get used to this. I'm used to wearing all these chains, and and I'm like, dude, this is baseball. This isn't a rap basketball <laughs> video. That's the other thing. They, <laughs> that's the I can shit on baseball. You shit on baseball it, I love it so much because I love it, man. Yeah, you, I hear you. They've come in with show the show uh, the elbow guard, the wrist thing, the thing over here. The show they 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 look like knights in shining armor, man. <laughs> even even the helmet, they got that long thing now, like little league, which is okay. I you know I'm not gonna shit on that, but right. I I just think that it. it I don't know. They they just soften everything up too much sometimes. I, I, and, and it's all sports. I mean, I think all sports have have has pre, have pretty much evolved to the point where it's not the same as what it used to be. Like I'm a big boxing fan, and you know, back in you know when I was growing up, you know, and we used to put it in fifteen rounds for for the team. You know, and now these guys are tired after the eighth round and they're bigger and they're stronger and they're faster. And now they don't want to fight. The best doesn't want to fight the best. Back then you got Duran and, and Hearns and Leonard, all these guys fighting each other. That That's when I was really into boxing during the 1960s, 70s, late 60s, 70s, when, when, when the, the Thriller in Manila, you know, all those. And I've been watching, I've been watching recently on, on uh, YouTube. I've been watching some of the old fights. I do the same just so exciting and so like I remember my heart beating boom 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 you know when and when Hagler was was fighting against you know uh, Sugar Ray Leonard when when all these guys were just out there doing it I mean uh, uh Tommy Hearns that's the guy that, that I met a while back uh and he was already his mind was over oh, 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 oh. <laughs> but Tommy Hearns he wasn't glamorous like 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 uh, um like like some of the others like Sugar Ray or or, or or the guy from Massachusetts, I forget his name. Um, but he was a good fighter. I've seen some of his fights. Oh, so yeah. He was a great fighter. Tommy Hearns? Oh, yeah. I mean, the way he was built, monster right hand. I mean, yeah, no, he's a legend. And, and, and again, all these guys fought each other for they legacy. Didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't try to avoid each other. They fought each other. Alex Aguayo, when he fought, and, and, and what's his name? Uh, um, uh, the, uh, the Mexican pretty boy. Uh, Chavez, no, not Chavez. The other one, the one that beat Chavez. Oh, uh, Oscar De La Hoya. La Hoya, yeah. yeah I had Oscar. a joke about Oscar De La Hoya, and I had to, I had to not do it. You know, remember when those pictures came out that he was dressed like a woman? Exactly where you were going. <laughs> so I had a joke. I had a joke, right? So I was in San Antonio, and I was doing the joke. I was at a Mark Anthony concert, and I was like. These women in San Antonio are the most beautiful women in the world. Oh my God. Just before 
the show, I was looking at this girl and I'm like, oh my God, look at those heels, look at the legs. Oh my God, look at that, that wide, oh shit, wait a minute, that's Oscar de la Hoya. <laughs> <laughs> and they told me, somebody told me, he might be in the audience, don't do that joke tonight. Wow. <laughs> I would have been He's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Joke one time about George Clooney, and George Clooney was in the audience in in Long. Yeah. I did a joke in Long Island. I forgot what the joke was. Something about him being knocked down so many times. I don't know, but he had just fought. He had just fought somebody, and he got knocked down like five times. You know, back then they didn't stop the fight. The bell didn't save you. And uh, I did a joke about George Clooney. He was Jerry Clooney. You mean Jerry Jerry Clooney? Jerry Clooney. George oh, that, so that five knockdown that must have been against Larry Holmes. It could have been, yeah, yeah. yeah. All mm -hmm. I know, like right after that, and he lived in Long Island. So I'm I'm working in a place in Long Island, and it was a nice big club. And I did the joke. I don't, can't remember what it was, and I saw this massive figure standing up and walking away. Oh, and somebody said George uh, Jerry Cooney was in the in the audience. Wow. George yeah, right? George. Jerry, oh, George Cooney. <laughs> Jerry Cooney. George Cooney is much better looking than Jerry Cooney. For sure. Not as good a fighter, though. Not as good. Not as good as fighter. Can't <laughs> but, but, uh, but hey, so let me ask you a question. What do you think of this? Uh, 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 what's his name? Um, uh, uh, Mike Tyson and, and uh, what's his name? Paul, Jake Paul. Well, listen. <laughs> Personally, I don't want to see. I was. I'm. I'm a big Mike Tyson fan. Okay. I, I don't want to see him at 60 years old go in there and potentially take a dive because I'm thinking maybe that's what happens. I don't know. Maybe this is set up. But either way, the fan in me, I like it because I love Mike Tyson. So any opportunity to see him one more time, I don't care. Right. You know, right. How old he is, but I mean, he's he's pushing 60 years old, and I think this is just going to be more of a show than yeah than a fight. It's already. You know what? They've already kind of let it out of the bag that is more of a show. Right. And, uh, and I, because they said there's not going to be any winners or losers. Yeah. Then what's the only, point? Only if you get knocked down, knocked out. Yeah. You know, if you get knocked I, out or if the fight stops, it has to be stopped. Yeah. To be honest, I think that I'm a big Mike Tyson fan too. I think that he doesn't have fire in him he doesn't have anything not. he doesn't have he doesn't have that 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 tiger in him anymore you know no. he's a great fighter if he punches you you're going to be knocked out i think if he punches jake paul he's going to knock him out but i think that he's going to be told you know take it easy unless, i agree unless this guy's really bringing it make it easy and, and then maybe Maybe he wows out then and, and 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 goes out of character and decides to kill this guy. But I don't know. Like I said, I'm not looking forward to that part of it. He mellowed so much in the last few years. You know, he doesn't have that, you know, eye of the tiger, like you know, Rocky would yeah. say. You know, you know, yeah, he's I mean, funny. I'm sure he's doing it for the money. You of know. course. Yeah, yeah. So just like anybody else, it's it, the, the one thing I will say is it's gonna sell. People are gonna watch it. So oh, yeah. I mean, from a business perspective, brilliant. It's on Netflix. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna watch it. I complain. I'm a true, true boxing fan, and when I first heard about it, I'm like, really? Yeah. But even I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch it. So, you know, it is what it is. But I'm not expecting much other than a show. Yep. So you gotta, you gotta temper your expectations. But that's even know, when uh, Muhammad Ali fought the wrestler, the Japanese wrestler, was it? An Aoki, Anoki. It was like that's a show. It's not a real wrestler against boxer. It was, a, it was a show. They took the money and they ran. That's it. Absolutely, absolutely. Any uh, name me, give me some famous boxers that you've met. Uh, Mark Breland, uh, Tommy Hearns, uh, Bobby Shez. Remember Bobby Shez? I do I do? So, yeah, light heavyweight. I was doing a show in Lodi, New Jersey, one time, and. Bobby Shez was in the audience. And I knew he was in the audience, and he had just lost to somebody. Again, another guy that lost, right? <laughs> joke. I'm like, and you know, oh, you know, you better be cool because 
I said something stupid, you know, like, ah, you better be cool because I can knock you out or some shit like that. He came up on stage. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how solid that guy was, man. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> and, oh, I also met who came to see me one time at Dangerfields in New York, um, Hector Camacho. All right. Macho man. And he was, he was little, but man, he was like a rock too. Like, you know, I put my arm around him to take a picture. And he was he was like a rock. I got a picture somewhere. I wish I had it handy. I'd show it to you. He was he was little. He was that, you know, he had that little curl, you know. Mm -hmm. He was, he was just, for it. you know. But when I put my arm around him, I could feel like rock hard his shoulder. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you met uh you met Trinidad too, right? Tito Trinidad? Met Trinidad in Puerto Rico. I had the debacle in in the uh, oh, my 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 rumble in the jungle, uh, <laughs> my thriller in San Juan. <laughs> I, I heard about that. I heard about that where you kind of told the Puerto Rican people to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went out there. It was, it was, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was a Mark Anthony concert. It was the first time the, the Roberto Clemente Stadium was being opened for an event. And uh, so I, I was good friends with Roberto Clemente Jr. So I called him up and he flew down. And his he flew down with his girlfriend to because he was living in New York and my parents were there my my mother my father front row seats and then I get to the stadium and they told me I can't be on the big screens so I said if you if I can't be on the big screens they can't see me if they can't see me they're not gonna they're not gonna listen I'm not gonna have a good show not only that there was two other opening acts before me so it was three opening acts and you know the people in Puerto Rico they just want Mark. Right. It's 2002. And the first act went up, got booed off the stage. Second act went up, three girls, I think it was three girls, beautiful girls, Latinas, dancing and singing. You would think they got booed off the stage after three songs. And then they took an intermission, a 15 minute intermission. I said, you're killing me. You're killing me because now they're going to think Mark is going to come out. And then I came out. And it was disaster. It was horrible. It was so bad. Oh my God. They wouldn't stop booing. They wouldn't stop saying pa fuera, pa fuera, pa fuera. Wow. And my parents were right there, man. Right there. And then you, you just flipped out. So finally I just stopped and I went over to them and I, you know, I I, I gave them, I told them this was my this is my Oscar speech. Because I may never win an Oscar, so I'm gonna give you my. And I told them how much I was, how happy I was that they were my parents, what great parents they were, you know, stuff like that. And then the audience kind of quieted down, and I saw there was cameras filming my parents, so they were taking it for the news and for the newspaper. So they took pictures of my parents and me, and um, after that, I told them, no, 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 and I threw the microphone down. I said, you know. Puerto Rico, you know, I wanted to come here. It was my lifelong dream to perform where my roots are and, and parents are here. This has been the biggest disappointment of my career so far. I was treated so much better in the United States and in Canada than right here. So these are the memories I'm bringing, I'm taking back home to New York is that you suck. And I said, que se va carajo. <laughs> and I threw the microphone down. And um, when I got back, all the radio stations were asking, you know, what happened? What happened? I, you know, I told them I didn't care. And then uh, my brother sees this article in TV, TV, it's like a little ma magazine. Right. It was an article with a picture of me on the stage and my looking up. As a matter of fact, I have it. I have it on the wall, and it's a whole article about how. Mark Anthony should never bring this guy. Well, what a disgrace. He insulted the Puerto Rican pu public. And I, I, I cut it out. I framed it. I, I got it in my I got it in my other room. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and then Mark Anthony got married to Dianara three months later. And I went to Puerto Rico for the wedding. When I landed in Puerto Rico, everybody knew who because it was in the news and it was in the newspaper and Mark Anthony is the biggest thing. And this guy that brings insulted Puerto Rican, right? So I had to get in the cab like that and go to the hotel. When I got to the hotel, the lady behind the counter said, you're that guy. 
Wow. So, I, so here's the thing. I promised to never go back to Puerto Rico and perform. Like I always went back to Puerto Rico because I love it. Right now, my sister and I have a house there, and I go there all the time. Uh, I never went back to perform in Puerto Rico. And Chris Rock was doing a show in Puerto Rico. This was like 10 years later. He said, you got to do this with me. I go, I'm not doing it. He goes, do it with Rick. This is a Chris Rock venue. Big venue. I'm not doing it. He says, "No, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. You'll see." I said, nope. Doing. He had to talk me. He had to talk to me for a month to talk me into going to Puerto Rico. And when I went there, it was the greatest show ever because it was a comedy audience. It was an audience that was ready for comedy, and they were ready. They knew English, spoke English. Rock. And then they were shocked. They were surprised. Oh shit! This guy's Boricua, even though he's a New Yorkian, you know. But at least he. Right. So it was one of the best shows ever. The best shows ever. Well, that's good. You got a chance to redeem yourself. I redeemed myself. But last year I was gonna go with with Mark because I never been back to Puerto Rico with Mark. All these years that he goes, I don't go. So last year I said, you know what? I think it's time I go back. Yeah. So Mark, I said, listen. I know I'm not on the schedule to go to Puerto Rico, but I want to go to Puerto Rico. He said, all right, if you want to go to Puerto Rico, you go. But remember what happened. <laughs> but he'll do that shit. He'll he'll point shit out to you. I go, oh, you still remember that shit? It's been 20 years. <laughs> he, wow. You want to do it? Do it. But remember what happened? But what happened? It's on you. So then at the last minute, I decided not to do it. I was just like, you know what? I don't need the stress. I don't need the stress of thinking, uh, is it gonna happen again? You know. I hear that, man. That's that's a great story. That's a legendary story right there. It was the last show my parents ever saw me perform in. Wow. Way after that. Oh man. Away from shame. That was it was Paris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff, man. That's good stuff, man. I uh, this is this has been uh this has been amazing, man. I have one more thing here. That I that I want to go over with you. You got uh, it's it's my version of rapid fire. Okay. Okay. But since I'm a boxing fan, I'm calling it stick and move. All right. Yeah, stick and move. Absolutely. So I'm gonna give you something, and you're gonna tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Go. Let's do it. All right. This is gonna be rough. This might be like the crowd in Puerto Rico. All right. All right. All right. Try <laughs> All right. Favorite food? Favorite food, uh, pernil, arroz con gandules, tostones. Oh, I love it. Oh, Puerto, I love Rican. It. Puerto Rican food. Favorite food. Making me hungry already. Favorite movie? Favorite movie, uh, Injustice for All with Al Pacino, The Godfather. Favorite, Favorite comedian you've worked with or written for? Uh, Chris Rock. I've written for him. I've worked with him. He used to open for me. Uh, I've opened for him in bigger venues. Uh, Chris Rock. You might have answered this earlier, but favorite athlete of all time? Athlete would have been Roberto, Roberto Clemente. Awesome. Favorite late night snack? So when you're chilling at home in your boxes, Uh, if I'm watching TV with my wife late at night, I have to be kettle popcorn, sometimes okay. drink with chocolate. Not bad. So settle this debate. Benil or jamon? <sighs> Not even close, right? Not even close. Benil. Pateles or empanadas? Nice loaded pasteles, yes. Otherwise, empanadas. Sometimes the pasteles are what we call ciego. You know, they have just a little bit of meat in the middle. They call them, <laughs> right? Nice loaded yeah. pastel, but an empanada that's loaded too. I'm gonna have to go with empanada. Okay, okay. Best piece of advice anybody ever gave you? <laughs> this is gonna be horrible. This is this is gonna get me in trouble, but I don't care, because this is the one of the best pieces of advice. My father told me a long time ago. Now, 
I am true blue, proud of my heritage, proud of being Puerto Rican. I will never deny it. My father was a proud Puerto Rican. He always said, watch out for your own kind. They will screw you more than anybody else because they feel comfortable doing it. It's not hard to believe. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not hard to believe. And I, and I say it with a little sadness because I'm very proud. And, and, and But that was one of the best pieces of advice my father ever gave me. Okay. That's good. That's good. If you can invite three dinner guests, anybody, people you've never met, who would you invite? People I've never met. Could this, be, it could be whoever you didn't or, or did. Somebody you'd like to meet or some, one of your favorite people. This question uh, made me cry. I was asked this question by uh, Pique Santos on his podcast, and he, he caught me by surprise. Uh, it would have to be my brother. He passed away, and he was my friend. And it was, uh, to this day, I listen to his advice. You know, my brother, my father, and my That's brother. awesome. I love it. I love it. Last one. Um, you were stuck in, in, a, in a foxhole and you needed to get out of there. You had to have one person in there to help you get out. Who would that person be? My brother. Awesome. You survived. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Almost in, though. What are you currently working on? Are you doing, are you working on some shows? Are you working on anything on TV? I am currently trying to put my show back together, American, which like I said before, it's, it's called American with the accent on Rican. Okay. And it's a show about me growing up in New York and Puerto Rico, you know, going back and forth. The things that I learned well, when I lived in Puerto Rico, and the things that I learned as opposed to the things in New York, you know, the differences, Christmas in New York, Navidades in Puerto Rico, you know, caroling in New York, patandas in Puerto Rico, you know, differences, how, uh, you know, for example, we carol here in the United States, people carol, we don't, but, you know, you know, we wish you a Merry Christmas, eight o'clock in the afternoon, in the, in the evening, you know, we wish you a Merry okay, thank you, good night. Puerto Rico, parrandas, not at 8 o'clock, not at 9 o'clock, not at 10 o'clock, not 11. Those bastards wait for you to go to sleep. And 3 o'clock in the morning, you know what I'm saying? They know what I'm saying. They know what I'm saying. Oh, man. You're right. So that's what I'm putting together. It's called Amer American. Amer American with accent on the weekend. Oh, I can't wait, man. You got to make sure that, you, that that makes it to Florida somewhere. So I can come and check you out. Take it to Orlando. Even better. I'm about I'm about less than an hour. And if it does great in Orlando, we take it to you know take it to Tampa. We take it you know we take it all over Clearwater, oh. Latino because it's all about Latinos. No, yeah, well you you do well in Orlando. Right. It's about me and being Puerto Rican here there, but it it's also like South Americans, Mexicans, they could all identify with it too because there's a difference between their country and here so they can see the difference so even though it's american it's not it's not just about puerto ricans because sometimes people think that oh that's a that's about puerto ricans forget it you know right right well listen i can't wait for it hopefully it does hit orlando i know i do know that you have a show that's coming up in wesley chapel yes in june i will be there i, I will be there Tell your friends, tell everybody you know. Let everybody know. I think it's uh, the end of June, right? Yep, the end of June. So um, so I will be there. Um, and for all my uh, viewers, if you are new to watching my video, please subscribe. This is how we do it up here at the Hangout Spot. Every week we talk boxing, we talk football, we have special guests, we have comedy legends. I mean, we do it all here. So Listen, make sure you're all for life. Uh, I want to learn more about boxing and 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 because uh, I I haven't followed for a while. I haven't followed boxing, and I haven't followed basketball or football. Although basketball, I watched a couple of games the other day, and I'm amazed that they don't call double dribble. They don't call walking anymore. They don't yeah. like when I was a kid. It's walking, walking. You know, you take more than steps. Now they take like they go half court. 
they go running half court with the and you know here's another thing as a comedian i gotta tell you they gotta raise the basket because those baskets are 10 feet high that's when the players used to be five eight five nine not <laughs> three you know they just they don't even dunk they just like <laughs> yeah, they right. the baskets man raise them <laughs> Uh, the game, the game is the, all sports like we talked about have definitely changed. But listen, if you want to learn more and you want to get into boxing, then you got to subscribe to my channel, man. And you got to watch my videos. We'll watch your videos and subscribe. Yes, you got to subscribe. And like I said to my viewers, make sure you subscribe as well. But listen, this has been an absolute honor. And I want to thank you again for your time, for coming on here. Um, I really appreciate it. I think my viewers will love it. Yes, great. I, I had a great time. I had, you know, I, I love just, you know, going out there talking about everything. I just, you know, especially old boxing, you know, like I was an avid boxing fan back in the day. Um, so it was just up until, you know, I guess five years ago, I really stopped watching box, boxing. And, you know, then I, I tried to watch the MMA and all that, but, you know, it's like, yeah. Ya estoy viejo. Ya estoy viejo. Eight o'clock. What? What time? It's ten o'clock. I gotta go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. All right. And as always, man, this is your boy Johnny with Joey Vegas signing out from the Hangout Spot, and I will talk to everybody soon. Thank you, John. Thank you.